Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Sheldon Cox. I'm a lead teacher at the Instructional Technology Department. And today we're presenting approaches to simultaneous instruction, resources, and strategies. I want to introduce uh, myself and also presenting with me will be Kathleen, sorry, also presenting with me will be Elena Malachekno, also in the Instructional Technology Department. Let's take a look at your directors and introduce your directors at your, uh, the district. The chief academic officer is Dr. Kathleen Black. We have the bilingual educator, Annalise Cruz, ELA director, Dr. Karen Fahey, math director, Elka Pacho. I said it wrong, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and it's there's and Kayla Paco. I'm Kayla, Kayla Paco. Paco. I, know, I know, I'm just nervous. I'm so sorry, guys, ladies. Thank I'm you, Kayla. Sheldon. I appreciate that. <laughs> uh, Social Studies Director uh, Ryan Keaton, Multilingual Educator uh, Abel Perez Pichette, if I'm saying that correctly, pretty sure I'm not. Uh, the Arts Department, Dominique Ricard, um, Athletic Director, Dr. Carlos Cotto. Library, uh, library Systems and Media Services, Dr. Colleen Sadowski, Pre-K, uh, Rebecca Boyle and Dr. Robin Hooper. And of course, the Office of Pro Professional Learning, Severia Calloway Downs. We've all been working together to create this presentation for you to give you as much information as we can to help you transition from teaching online to now teaching both virtually and physically in the classroom. And I think we forgot science. I'm not sure if you said it. So I'll say Dr. Adele Mater, welcome. And um, oh, okay. again, as Sheldon mentioned, I'm going to turn my video on as well. <laughs> so as Sheldon mentioned, this is a collaborative um, presentation where we're going to guide and help you think about uh, what simultaneous instruction can look like in the classroom. This presentation will be shared um, later with you if it hasn't already. We will obviously have it in our CSD Learns website, so definitely check it out there, as well as our recording. Uh, you also will find um, that you can respond and ask questions um, on YouTube. So if you have questions specifically for the simultaneous instruction, the structure, uh, the, the instructional design, and what it could look like in the classroom, the setups, the technology setups, that's what we're going to discuss today. But if you have questions, please put them in the chat. We'll be able, we will try to answer as many as we can. We know that we have a lot of participants and we really appreciate that you all are here to listen to our presentation. Uh, but anything that we don't answer, we will most likely uh, more uh, will look and find the information and will reach out to you. Uh, we will also have another presentation like this on the 27th. And if you've seen the schedule on the 20th and the 27th, you will have more detailed uh, work with your directors as well on this topic. So in overview, I do want to just point out that our awesome RCSD teachers uh, since the challenge of starting remote instruction um, really have transformed uh, the spaces in your homes, right? Where you are now in your home facilitating online instruction to your students remotely and teaching your students to use amazing digital tools uh, to communicate, to collaborate and really build relationships with, with each other. We are now embarking in a new phase of our school reopening journey and this phase of simultaneous instruction where we define it as an instruction that is led by the teacher and is uh, accessed by students online and in person at the same time. Please keep in mind though how much we've grown from the beginning of remote learning until now. We've learned and applied new strategies, adapting them as we go. And you know what? It hasn't been easy and it hasn't been perfect. And that's okay. What we're going to be doing now is very similar to what we've been doing in remote instruction. 
But the good thing is, is now we do have some background knowledge and we have some experience that we can build from, right? Things that we've learned from that remote instruction and the things that we already know as educators and the tools and strategies that we've been using. For this presentation and this kind of binder-like uh, presentation that we've created, we've compiled resources and ideas from teachers all over the country that have been doing this since the beginning of the school school year in September and October, as well as we're in communication with the amazing teachers in phase one that have started this journey already uh, from last week. Uh, we do continue to encourage to communicate with us. Let us know if you need any help and support, either if you're in phase one or two or three in this journey. Um, so we're going to go through and let me just go to the next slide. We want to also remind you that, um, you know, some of these guiding principles, and these are the really the best practices and things that we've seen our teachers already do in the classroom anyways, right? So we want to again remind you that even though we're moving to simultaneous instruction in some part of our weekly schedule, we will continue to apply as many tools as we can that we've already been using and the practices that we've been utilizing during the remote learning. So here are some uh, guiding principles for you, and I'm not going to read it all in detail. But again, the biggest one is making sure that we're equitable and we're giving equitable access to our students, both in class and at home. And uh, being mindful of continuing to use resources like Google Classroom and Seesaw to put your digital resources and organize them there. So then no matter where the students are located, if they're fully remote, if they're coming into class a couple of days a week, they're still being, being able to access all of the resources in that same place. Keep using the variety of strategies, uh, but think about, you know, simple strategies that could help um, not only with the structures in the class, but also organization such as moving from whole group to small group, um, thinking about how to transition from one activity to another, as well as continuing to check students' progress. We want to make sure that we continue to encourage student engagement. And I know that sometimes it's been difficult in the remote setting. And we hope that bringing some of the students into face-to-face -face environment, into actual classrooms, we can get more student engagement, both the ones that are in class, but then also the ones that are still at home. Continue to utilize tools to get students thinking visible, right? Let the continue to use if you're using Padlet or Flipgrid or Jamboard. Don't think that you're now not able to use those tools. Continue to use those digital tools and continue to connect with students and monitor their progress no matter where they're located. Engage in cultural relevant teaching and provide students with that timely reflection and feedback on their learning. We also want to remind you of the Rochester Instructional Framework because that really drives our instruction in our CSD. And again, we want to remind you that we're continuing the work that we do in face-to-face -face environment and that we transition to remote and now going into simultaneous instruction. We want to remind you that our framework um, is there to support your lesson planning and instructional practice that it reflects on the district emphasis on the workshop model as the foundation of the classroom instruction in K-12. This workshop format provides students in supportive environment and it involves authentic learning experiences that focus on strength and needs of each student, which we know is not only um, needed during a regular classroom, but it's more so needed right now during the pandemic. So we want to just encourage you to continue uh, using the Rochester Instructional Framework for your design of your instruction. And again, you will be guided into more of that and what that could look like um, is specifically for your content area or K-6 and different content areas on those, the, the 20th and the 27th, when you actually meet with the directors, when they talk specifically about the content. 
But today, what we want to do is talk about some of the structures that could be um, thought about and put in place in your classroom when you are working through the simultaneous instruction. Because I know one of the questions that we have seen a lot on Twitter and Facebook from the teachers who are just starting out doing this is what is it going to look like, right? Like, what am I supposed to do? And again, the biggest reminder here for you and and we understand that some teachers are are um, scared and frustrated, but we do want you to understand that we are we should be taking the things we already know and we already been using, and we try them and see what happens, and then we modify when needed. We want to talk about a couple of structures of instruction, and then we're going to go more into the organization of what the classroom with the with the different technologies in the classroom could look like. And again, some helpful um, strategies based on uh, the phase one teachers that have been trying this out already, as well as teachers all over the country that have been doing this in September. So in terms of a whole group instruction, that is something that probably every teacher knows of because most of us do this at least in part of our class setting. Whole group instruction in a regular kind of um, traditional class um, is a little bit different uh, than it would be in simultaneous. And the differences in simultaneous instruction, students are attending virtually and physically in class, will be watching and listening, listening to the teacher at the same time, right? So now you have students in front of you and then you have students on Zoom at the same time. Uh, and the teacher, again, is still presenting the information, uh, but being mindful that you are presenting it to both students and you're speaking to both students at the same time. So we do um, want to show you just a quick generic example and then I show you some ideas of things to think about. You should not have all the answers right now of what this is going to look like in your classroom. These are just some ideas so you can start really thinking about it, uh, maybe asking questions, collaborating with other teachers, and some ideas of ways that this could work in your class. So these are all just examples and ideas for you to start thinking. In this example of whole group structure, we have a teacher who has been familiar and has been using Google Slides. So again, we encourage you as teachers to continue to use the resources that you've already been using with your students, because not only would that be helpful to you because you're familiar with them, but they're also going to be helpful to students because it's going to be a consistent structure in your class. It's a consistent routine teams and strategies and tools that you've been using with your students. So not as much as changing. So in this case, the teacher is using Google Slides with Pear Deck. She is post, uh, putting the slides uh, right on the smart board, but then she's also sharing that screen on Zoom. And we'll show some examples of how the teachers have been doing this in phase one of our, our schools. When this is happening, the students in class will be watching the teacher. They will be looking at the smart board to seeing the presentation. And they will be using tools like paper and pencil, sticky notes, or maybe individual whiteboards to interact, right? So the biggest thing here is we're not having teacher just talk through the presentation, but we're soliciting those questions, uh, soliciting student work and feedback. So then they are engaged in the learning. So they're not just listening, they're actively participating. And then the at-home students are doing the same thing. They're still looking at that presentation, but because of the Pear Deck add-on in the this example, by the way, again, this is just an example, uh, but the students are interacting with this presentation digitally when they are at home 
through Zoom. And they're able to answer the questions and solicit their information right on that Pear Deck. And then the teacher's job will be to make sure to um, share out the work that the students are putting in in Zoom through Pear Deck, but then also the students that are maybe doing this on paper and pencil or sticky notes. So that's kind of where a little bit of a difference between the whole group in a traditional setting to the whole group in simultaneous instruction. I wanted to also share out, or we as a department wanted to share out some images of um, what this kind of looks like uh, or has looked like in phase one with some of the teachers and the things that they've been doing. And there are some ideas to consider. Um, so if you notice in this picture up top, um, you can see the teacher, the way the teacher is standing with the students and facing the all-in-one computer that does have a web camera. So if your setup is like this, and again, we'll talk a little bit more about setup, Sheldon will do that in about 15 minutes or so. But here, what's nice is you can see that the students at home are not only seeing the teacher, but they're seeing the entire class. And then they feel like they're part of the class. And honestly, I put a bet that they'll feel more engaged. And I'm curious to see if more students will actually turn on their cameras because now they're seeing more of their um more of the students in the class uh, on cameras as well. So that's just a nice way of you can see how whole group instruction could look like. Here's another image of whole group instruction where you have a teacher standing next to the computer and talking and facilitating, as well as showing on the board the students that are on Zoom. There's some things to consider when you're doing whole group instruction. One big one is being able for students on Zoom to hear you, because not only are you in a bigger space than you are in your, in your home, in a room, but you're also wearing a mask and you might not be as close to the computer as you would be if you are just teaching remotely. So definitely things to consider, and this is going to be more of a trial period of trying things out and where should you stand to be a little bit closer to the computer or to the audio so the students at home can hear you. Um, we again put in some ideas for you to consider and you can read them. Um, and then we'll address them later on as well. But I know some teachers are using video um, recordings. I've talked to some teachers through my help hours that they're using Screencastify. You know, continue to use those resources. Um, we're not asking you to try new things per se, even though there's definitely some new things that could help you and support your instruction better. But if you're using some of those tools, don't give them up. Continue to use them and see how they could fit in this um, new type of simultaneous instruction. We also want to quickly touch base on another type of structure um, when you are delivering instruction and having students also work um, during the time in the class. And that is learning station rotations and centers. That is something that also majority of our teachers not only are familiar with, but usually do it sometime within their uh, teaching schedule. And again, we wanted to just um, give you just a little bit of differences of what it could look like in this type of simultaneous instruction. So again, we're still doing things that we used to do, right? Um, you might be using stations right now when you're doing remote teaching, and you might have used station rotations when you did face-to-face -face teaching in the traditional setting. Um, so now you can definitely continue to do that in simultaneous instruction. Just noting a couple of differences. 
Now in this case, station rotation is a blended learning model, by the way. And if you've taken our blend and flip classroom on e-learning, you would have uh, learned a little bit more about both whole group and station rotation models as a way to blend in the technology anyways. But in this case, um, the learning activities, uh, it's like a, station rotations are composes a series of learning activities and that students work uh, through them um, independently. Um, some stations might be teacher stations and some t uh, stations might be online. Now, something to think about and a little bit of the difference is with the COVID um, reality, right, and with the CDC guidelines, the rotations might not be actual physical movement from one, one group to the other of students moving from um, station to station, but think about learning stations or centers or as a transition from one activity to another, right? So you, the students are still sitting in there. Um, um, seats. Uh, maybe you do, you give them some time to obviously move around near their seat, um, but they're not necessarily moving from station to station and the stations are coming to them. Um, the biggest um, thing that we've seen, uh, again, from reading all of the uh, feedback that we've gotten from teachers all over the country that have been doing simultaneous instruction is when you are doing learning station um, centers, um, you are definitely have more of an opportunity as a teacher to divide your time and attention between the students in class and at home. And so you're really giving your time time to both groups. So that is a very positive in doing something like this, or at least trying to implement it within your um, teaching time with the students. Here's an example of what it could look like in a class. Now be again mindful that this is just a very, very quick example. Um, this one in particular has only three stations, um, you know, and again, as teachers, we might have four, we might have two, it really is going to depend. Um, in this case, we have divided the students into two groups and our groups are divided by the location of where the students students are located. One group is the in-class group, the other is at-home group. Now, that does not mean that that's the end-all be-all, but what we've read, again, from examples is this is one of the easiest ways to implement something like this, and it is the best way to, again, as a teacher, to devote your um, time with both groups of students because that's that equity, right? It's being able to to, um, give your time to both all groups of students so then they all get the same instruction. In this case, just again, we wanted you to think about through the technology lens of a teacher who is maybe, um, again, some of the devices and things that they're using. In this rotation, in the first rotation, the teacher is working with an in-class group. So as the teacher is working with the in-class group in a small group setting, the students at home are either working individually or collaboratively on a digital task. So something that you already have been working with students on doing. You can even put them, and we have some examples of putting students in individual Zooms, so then they could work individually on an assignment and you don't have to necessarily worry about management of the students um, on Zoom while you're devoting your attention to the in-class students. Then you have students rotate. And again, this is just an example. But as you rotate, the students in class are now set up to be working either collaboratively or individually. And of course, if I say collaboratively, we're still following the CDC guidelines. So making sure that we're still um, following those, even though the students are working collaboratively. But then the at-home students are working with teacher on Zoom. So then if the students at home were working on a previous assignment individually or collaboratively, this is a great time for a teacher to revisit that assignment, um, to not only hold students accountable, but answer some of those questions um, or maybe uh, address some of those misconceptions with the students.
And then you'll notice we did add a third rotation um, just to also show you that, um, you know, station rotations and centers are a great opportunity to give you time um, to really address individual student needs. And so then uh, if you're given that time for students to independently work on either some digital tools, um, such as like CERN or um, something uh, um, else, and then, you know, the ones in class or maybe doing an independent reading book we're working on individual assignment, the teacher can meet with students and uh, really not only build relationship with the students, but really help and guide students and move them forward uh, towards, um, you know, the outcomes and the goals of the lessons. And then we also want to again show you some examples uh, from our phase one teachers. In the first example, and this one might not necessarily be in this particular moment a station, but what I wanted to show was that idea of collaboration, as I mentioned earlier. In here, you can see that the students are facing each other and following the CDC guidelines. So you could feel like there's a little bit more of a community and students can still have those conversations. This doesn't mean that this has to look like this um, every single day of the class, but this is again just some options for you to start thinking um, when you go into the classroom and what it could look like. We also have another example here where you see a teacher working with student and individually and the students using their um, individual whiteboards. We do have some ideas here and some examples to again um, thinking about if you were to use the structure either in um, the entire class period and so, or some part of the class period, um, what that could look like. And just remind again of um, some of those strategies and tools um, that you're already equipped with. Um, so for instance, one is creating agenda of your stations or agenda of even a weekly of what's happening every day. Um, I'm teaching right now a remote learning course on, on e-learning and I have some awesome teachers sharing some really amazing um, routines and structures that they have put in place. And, and a lot of them, you know, are using the agendas and using the weekly planners and um, giving students ideas of, you know, what the expectations are in different stations. And so again, we just encourage you to continue doing that. And if you're not and you need some help with it, definitely reach out to our department and we can definitely um, help you with creating some of those structures and give you some of the really cool templates uh, to use. And then another idea, of course, to consider is a timer. Um, timers are an amazing tool. Uh, obviously, most of us have used them even in a face-to-face -face instruction, but I think now, especially with um, simultaneous instruction and the transitions that need to happen from one um, part of the work to another, definitely a timer would be an amazing tool to continue to use. Also in this presentation, we have compiled with um, working with our content directors, we have compiled some classroom example um, charts and structures per se of what it could look like in your classroom. Again, these are all meant for uh, to help you uh, as you are going on this journey and thinking about what is it that your class is going to look like. Um, so when you get this presentation slides, I want to say 13 through 16, 17 or so, you'll see some of those examples that could help you based on the content area that you're teaching could help you kind of guide you as to continuing to use that Rochester instructional framework and those awesome routines and structures that you have in place in conjunction to the fact that we are going into simultaneous instruction. And with that, and the, also I do want to remind you that on the 20th and the 27th, you'll dive deeper um, into this, um, you know, into those structures specifically for your content areas.
So with that, I'm going to turn over to Sheldon, who's going to do the second part of the presentation, where he's going to dive a little deeper into what the classroom setup could look like and what are the technologies that you might have available in your class. Thank you, Elena. Um, thank you very much for that. That was very informative information. Please note you do not have to write all this stuff down. You can absolutely watch this video later on or put some questions into the chat and we'll continue to monitor the chat as the class goes on. I'm about to share my screen right now. And we'll And I understand that um, every classroom is different. All classrooms are set up uniquely based on the teacher and the equipment that's in the room. So we try to create a simple view that will cover all of the possible situations in all the classrooms. So here we have a classroom set up and most classroom will have a laptop that a teacher can use. And that laptop has a webcam that be connected to the, to the display and work in the classroom. It's most, a lot of classroom has an all-in-one desktop that just could also has a webcam built in and it can be connected to a display of some kind. A uh, few classroom has a Chromebook that can be used as well for your classroom centers, iPads. A few have document cameras you can use. And the cool thing about a document camera is that you can use it to display documents under it, like a book or a worksheet. We can also use it as a webcam. We'll talk about it soon. Um, display tools such as an interactive flat panel, whether it be a smart Promethean, uh, clear touch or Triumph, a smart board. Most rooms has a smart board of some kind or a HD TV, which is gonna be found in most of the high schools in the district. All rooms, all classrooms has sound in the room where they're coming from external speakers built-in speakers in the room or that display device they're using. And a lot of schools, FMP schools has the amplification system um, with a built-in microphone that will be used to project the sound in the classroom and to rest your voice. Instead of talking really loudly, you can use a built-in microphone to then um, transmit your voice into that classroom. Right? I understand that all schools do not have all of these equipment. You may have one or two or three of these pieces. Um, some school have all of these things. And you know, we'll have to take our time to figure out a way to customize your classroom for the best learning environment. Here's an example of a class setup. I went through and took a few pictures of people who are actually doing this in this classroom. This teacher is teaching using that his classroom instead of being at home, he's here at the school currently. He has set up in the school an all-in-one computer that's dedicated to the flat panel on the wall. He's using the webcam above the all-in-one computer. In his example, um, just note that he paid for himself an ex a, a, a light to get better lighting in his um, while he's presenting with your students. Um, let's take a look at the room. The laptop on the Zoom pointing at the students. So he has a laptop on a table that's pointing at the students in the room. If they were students in the room or presenting something happening in the room. The teacher is working on the smart board or desktop with the all-in-one computer to keep in engagement. The document camera is used to display content on his computer, which he can then display on the screen. And uh, the audio system projects the sound throughout the room and lets him use the microphone to then play the sound through the computer. Using um, some things to consider in this setting is the placement of the laptop, your external, your extra laptop, or your um, screen or where you will stand as you present because you want your students to be able to hear you. You also want, if you wanted them to see you, you can make sure and stand in the correct position or see the students. Avoid um, the document camera can be used as a secondary mic uh, camera. And for example, which is hard to tell to show right now, but if I switch cameras, I have an external um, webcam that can be used to show a different screen. So I can switch between showing myself or showing the students by plugging in the document camera or a secondary webcam, if you happen to have one. Um, you can use the desktop and extend the desktop, meaning I can have one thing on my desktop and have the Zoom window on another screen 
So I have the have the presentation on the smart board or interactive flat panel, and I have the Zoom screen on my desktop. So that way I can present on the desktop and yet monitor the chat and the students participating in my classroom, and I can interact with the students. Now, this doesn't mean this is available in every classroom, but it is possible to have this set up. Son of a gun. Here's another example of a classroom set up with a smart board connected with a laptop. In this example, um, I have my laptop connected to a, an HDMI and USB port in the classroom. The, um, the laptop is connecting to Zoom and I shifted the laptop across from me, so in front of me. So while I'm looking at, I'm looking at three things technically. I'm looking at the smart board, I'm looking at the Zoom and I'm also cruising, keeping an eye on the kids in the classroom as well. So it'll be a lot of monitoring, keeping those things. I'm gonna offer some recommendations later on that may be helpful. But so in this, I have the, and I also am wearing a mask. So with the mask and the camera directly in front of me, I can project my voice to that camera so that the students on the Zoom can hear me. And I'm also projecting enough for the students in the room can hear me. If I had an audio system in the room, I can use that to project my voice to make things a lot easier. The students can interact with the smart board providing they use the proper hygiene um, methods in your classroom. We'll talk about that in a few, in a few slides. Uh, but you want, and if you can have the kids interact with your lesson, it'll make the classroom, at least the students who are in physically in your classroom, the lesson more engaging. However, you could use tools such as um, uh, uh, Pear Deck or Smart, um, Smart uh, Suite Online to have kids in to get engaged in the lesson virtually, even though they're not physically in the classroom. Um, they consider the laptop needs to be close enough for the students to hear. So that means that when I project my voice, you can hear. And if I'm having the students in the room talking, I need to make sure and shift that laptop in an angle so that way the sound can travel to the laptop. Consider, uh, so consider the purpose on where you want your laptop to be. Consider how do you want your laptop to be set up, how, where it's gonna be positioned, whether I'll be sitting at the chair or standing by the smart board, whether I'm gonna have other students come up to the smart board. If you have a limited number of students, then you can pretty much dedicate a smart pen to a student. So that means that to say, for example, I have only four students in the classroom and there are four pens in the pen tray. I can say each person has their own color. So that way I can keep, you know, the less contact for kids using each other's pens as they use a smart board. So that's one way to do this. So I can dedicate a pen to a student if I needed to, depending on the number of students in the classroom, you know, um, another ways. And uh, of course, you know, make sure you address all social distancing um, and all the CDC guidelines. Here's another example of a smart board with an all-in-one desktop this time, knowing that I have a desktop that I can use in the classroom. I can keep my laptop to be used as a second computer, or I can have my, uh, my para use my, or assistant teacher or another teacher use my laptop if I need to, or I can monitor the chat or monitor the Zoom on the, my laptop while my Zoom, while the other desktop is also in the Zoom where I can continue my lesson. I can share my screen. So the teacher can work at the smart board or interactive flat panel with the all-in-one computer. The webcam is pointing at either myself or the classroom so people can see me moving around the classroom. All classroom has some form of sound in there and if there isn't, please make sure and contact help desk and create a ticket for them to install uh, speakers in your classroom if you do not have them, but I'm pretty sure that all classrooms have some kind of sound. So the sound on the computer where you're playing a video and or a um, sound, it will play through the classroom speakers. And if you're sharing the screen, it will play on the Zoom session as well. Most, if you're a K2 classroom, you may have access to an iPad so you can dedicate iPads to the individual students and have the cleaning process of keeping them clean and, and sanitize. To the, some things to consider, the desktop is turned towards the person in the class to see the content on the smart board. 
what I've been seeing is that if you have used those wireless mic, like I mentioned before, your sound is loud enough to transfer into the camera on the all-in-one computer or and or the mic. But something to consider when using two devices in the same room, for example, I have a all-in-one computer and a laptop in that Zoom, is to make sure and mute both one of the devices. Because if you didn't, it will create a feedback and make the sound back, bounce back and forth to each other. And personal tablets and or phone can be used in the classroom through the Zoom meeting. So that means if you want to use your own personal laptop, sorry, personal tablet, such an iPad or Android tablet or your cell phone, you can also add that to the Zoom session as well. Here's another example of a uh, high school where there is, instead of a smart board where kids are usually interacting with the smart board, you have an all-in-one touchscreen computer. Again, this device is connected to the Zoom in the class so the students can see each other. And in this example, the teacher has set up the screen to be one half will be the instruction piece, whether it be a presentation or a PDF the students was working on. They use that snap feature and the other half is the is the Zoom student. So you can see all the students in the Zoom session. The teacher is working a laptop. Of course, you cannot forget to do your attendance in your classroom. So make sure you use a laptop to do your attendance as soon as students come in. Um, uh, and all is the all the one computer, of course, is used as pointing to us the teacher in the Zoom and or the students. In this case, uh, in another case, I have a teacher who has a webcam that they purchased on their own that's set up to be pointing directly outwards at the entire class. So from any angle in the room, it shows you all the people in the class. And it worked really well by itself to pick up the sound from the teacher in the back of the room. So it kind of shift the way the teacher was set up in the classroom. They moved from being stationed at the all-in-one computer to now being more able to move to the back of the room to then project the sound. They also included, they also on their own, that teacher on their own for themselves, pay for themselves, bought a wireless keyboard and a wireless mouse to make their instruction more engaging. So that way they can kind of move and have more flexibility moving around. So if, for example, some things to consider is additional um, a webcam to use as, as yourself with your classroom. And I have purchased a webcam for myself as well, which I just showed you a second ago. I also have a, um, a microphone and headpiece when I was teaching at home because there is lots of sound happening at home. In a classroom this set, in this classroom setting, it's not gonna be feasible to have a headpiece attached to your ear as you're teaching a lesson unless it's a wireless form. So if you choose to purchase a wireless headphones and microphone, it may make walking around the room easier for you, but that's an option as well. Using styluses that can be used for each individual student because stylus can be pretty cheap to buy. You can buy pretty much a pen and styles built in together at any uh, 99 cent store, or dollar store. You can have each student have their own stylus to use when interacting with the all-in-one touchscreen computer. So the kids can come up to the screen and then use their own personal stylus or assign stylus to interact with the lesson. So they can draw, write equation, write a sentence, point things out, highlight things on the all-in-one in the classroom. Some troubleshooting um, solutions we've had for you and it's all in this presentation. Um, if the classroom speakers, you're getting feedback, it could be that the classroom speakers are just too loud, you're just kind of giving feedback. The microphone is too close to the amplification system. That means you've seen it happen before where someone picks up a microphone and they start making a loud hissing sounds because they're standing too close to the speakers. So just move away from the sound speakers. Sometimes you gotta check the cord to make sure they're plugged in. And I, I need, I can't express this enough. Um, this is audio. And when we talk about using your device, what I recommend is that you get to your building, you contact your principal contact your principal and they will check with your custodian to see if you can get into your room just so you can adjust your all-in-one computer, your desktop computer, your laptop computer, make sure all the cables you need, all the equipment you need is there. But in this room I'm in right now, I grab the monitor just to kind of adjust the height of it and I immediately pull the power cord accidentally. And imagine that happening to you during a presentation where you're teaching kids online and face-to-face. So it will just uh, create less uh, issues as you 
use your technology in your classroom. So get a chance to come into your building just to make sure everything is connected right, that you know everything is set up right and configured the way you need it, and then test out the sound. Test the sound in your classroom before you actually do it live for the first day of school. The students' Chromebooks, um, microphones, um, volume is too high. That means if there are students in the classroom and their sound getting feedback, it could be that their microphones are turned on. So it's picking up your sound and the sound from your mic as well. So it's kind of bouncing off each other. And you have multiple Zooms in the same room. These are all reasons why you can have um, feedback. Other issues of volume, maybe the volume, the microphone is too close. The level settings you can change in here, and I and we will create some instructions on how to configure these things for you in our RCSD Learns website. Um, uh, check the audio setting in the Zoom to make sure the speakers and microphones are all set. And the video setting, sometimes you forget to um, uh, choose the right camera. Check the video settings in the Zoom to choose the right camera. For example, in this case, I have two cameras, so make sure you choose selecting the right camera. Make sure it's not flipped so you can have the, when you're showing yourself working on a dry erase board or a big notepad that it doesn't look in reverse mirror version. So you, you know what I mean once you start working, but you've been doing this along, all along. So you have a general idea on how to make this work for your students. Next thing I wanna talk about is device hygiene. The device you're gonna be using in your classroom, you want to keep yourself safe and keep your students safe. And that will require um, some maintenance on your part from using the devices. So we, uh, the, we talked to Stacy Darby in the health department with the health to help us come up with some solutions to help you with this. Um, uh, so sanitize um, after each use. So that meaning that if your students can take some hand sanitizers, rub their hands before they use the technology and they can use that uh, while throughout the day in the class if you intend on them using the devices in your classroom such as a, well, shareable devices such as the smart board, the all-in-one computer or a tablet or a Chromebook or a computer lab, for example. And you can reply, reapply sanitizer before using the device but make sure the students don't touch their eyes or touch their mouth with that sanitized hand. Of course, you can use an individual device, interact with technology. So when possible, use a stylus or assign a pen and limit the number of students when possible to, in, to uh, use any device. Meaning you do not want the whole class sharing a, um, an iPad, meaning you're passing it around from student to student to student. Some specific cleaning protocols we have is uh, can be clean with the yellow wipes, um, Lysol wipes. And there is a reason for this. You know, we found that if you're gonna be using this in the classroom with your students, it's less likely to cause harm to the students and yourself. You can wipe down all shareable devices and leave a, about two minutes for it to pretty much sanitize and disinfect anything that being, you've been wiped down. So you're using a keyboard where multiple students are using it or a tablet or a stylus. You wanna wipe it down, give it about two minutes and then you can wipe off any excess. Do not use a blue disinfectant spray because it's potentially poisonous. Well, I don't know that actually, to be honest with you, but do not use the blue disinfectant spray and uh, and do not put, uh, please don't put hand sanitizer directly onto your devices. I do not want you to squeeze a glob of hand sanitizer directly onto the keyboard or directly onto the smart board or directly into the Chromebooks or tablets. You can see a building administrator for more information. All, all of them are aware of what is available for you to use in your classroom to keep your equipment sanitized and keep you safe and healthy. Our department you've been using all along have these technology resource RCSD Learn where we have a ton of resources you can use and documents to help you uh, make your lesson more engaging and to use the technology, those resources are still available. Please reach out to us available. And we also have a, a bunch of web tools you can use in your classroom as well here on our website on e-learning, our e-learning website. Please take advantage of all these resources and please note that even when 
being that you have kids working at home and kids working here in the school, if you have a special software that you can only use in school, you need to also have a way for them to do the same project at home if they don't have access to that software. So keep that in mind when designing projects and assignment. Um, just one thing I've learned as we're doing this and I've noticed so far as we do this, if we have someone that is, and if it's possible, if you have someone who is on face to face with the students and have an adult, whether it be another teacher or a para or a TA who is also online to support any questions, to keep, to keep things moving, to, to support your students that are online, it makes the process go a lot easier. It's a way to keep the kids engaged, keep yourself engaged, address any issues. For example, sound, you wanna make sure the sound is working. So having an adult online lets you know when you try to show a video that the video is working or not working. If you wanted to show a presentation, how many times you have asked, can you see my screen as an example. So having another adult online helps, you know, make the transition go much easier. I know that's not possible for most or some of you, but if you have that ability, please take advantage and work collaboratively with each other to then make the learning experience more engaging. But feel free to visit these sites and these resources, which will be available to you in the link um, after the presentation. Some ideas to consider. Uh, the Zoom video links and tutorial. We have the links for the Zoom. The share the presentation with the home students. So if you are presenting, you want to share that with the, pre the presentation with your home students. Breakout rooms, individual students who are working on together or working independently on a different station. Recording the class. And I, I like that a lot because you can record the session so your students can view it later in case they miss something or they need something else. Or you can record a video that you will use to present to both the, if for the whole group instructions. So instead of me teaching a lesson directly to the whole group, I can first start off with a quick video of the lesson. Well, I'll share the video in class and on Zoom. So we're all watching the same video at the same time. And then I will then transition to doing small group work with my students who need more support and have assignments for the students who do, as um, Elena mentioned before. Using a document camera, as you said before, as a second camera is a great uh, tool. You can also, of course, you can get another webcam, but using a document camera that's dedicated in your room, just make sure and call help desk if you need any software installed and they can help you with that process. And then joining the Zoom as a second device like I mentioned before, which would be a using your cell phone, your district laptop, or another device. Create uh, for other digital tools in silent teachers, which we can do, and which I use a lot is why I can um, use a picture as my background or use a Google slide and put it up on the screen where it's just presenting only the slide. Maybe it has the instructions or what you should be doing right now when I put kids into group. So kids can identify like what I should be working on now, I'll just share that slide as my silent teacher. So in Zern, you can use digital printed materials that we can print out and have for the students here that are doing work face to face and then have digital work for the students that are doing online. Um, the MyView High School and ELA presentation board will have materials you can use. And of course, using morning, during morning meetings, creating a slide that you share with your students and your students, with your students in person and your students at home. All these ideas will be available to you here after the presentation. So please come back and take a look at it. We also have, I don't know if you brought this up, Sheldon, uh, on this slide, there's a lot of resources. Again, I know that this is new for us, but across the country, teachers have been doing this simultaneous instruction or another word for it, concurrent teaching, concurrent instruction. So if you, um, would like to do a little bit more research on your own, read some articles. We have uh, found these articles that are very helpful to identifying, again, what the class um, structure and the class um, uh, instruction could look like. Also, depending on, you know, what you have in the class. And again, these are all uh, taken from teachers who have been doing this since September. So we also found some awesome videos to, again, identify um, what it could look like. And with that, Sheldon, I think we're on to our Q&A, right? 
Um, and we're not going to be able to answer all the questions. Um, we've definitely been answering some questions in the chat as we go. Some questions we can't answer because we need to go back and kind of look at that as well um, ourselves. And others might be answered more so during um, the other meetings that you uh, will attend either on the 20th and 27th. So don't think that we all have the answers and don't think that you all should have the answers right right now either, um, that everybody, you know, we're all kind of in this together, uh, working through it. Yeah, and no, please reach out to your, your lead teacher, your teaching assignment. We have, uh, in our department, we have a sign up for office hours so we can help with instructional technology um, questions you may have. Please reach out to your help desk and your principals if you need any questions and they can reach out to us to help you in any way we can. So I, I, if there are any questions, I guess we can answer questions if we have them right now or? Sure, so starting with some of the questions from the chat, um, there was a couple questions about how to do groups um, in person if the kids still have to be socially distant. Yeah, so again, um, when you're talking about um, groups, it might look a little bit different, um, but you could still social distance and follow the CDC guidelines and have students collaborating on the same um, activity and the same topic. Um, you might just have students being farther away, right? Um, especially in the beginning when you will, might not have as many students in class, I think it would be a quite bit easier for them to be as a group in class um, to work. In terms of at home, you could continue using um, the different digital resources for collaboration, so things like jam boards and padlets. Um, if you're not having students do breakout rooms where students can continue to work collaboratively on the same slide deck or in the same digital tool, but physically they're not together. So that's just an idea, but I would say definitely those are conversations to have with your content directors um, to get more ideas specifically for your content area and for the different activities that you wanna do. I definitely think um, doing some reading of some examples of ways that other teachers across the country has do have done it. Because again, it, we're not in a bubble, you know, we, uh, this isn't something that's just happening in our school. And it's not that I'm trying to put you at ease, but um, understanding that a lot of teachers um, are in the situation. And even though we understand um, the precautions and, um, and the, what we need to do, we also know how much helpful it is when students are with us face-to-face -face and the instruction that we can give them face-to-face -face, um, instead of just being online. Okay, um, I'm going to kind of try and bounce back and forth between the two of you. So Sheldon, while you were presenting, there was a bunch of questions about cameras in the classroom mm -hmm. um, and what is available there versus um, in, in rooms now with the all-in-ones. Oh, so that's a good question. So the minimum you have is your teacher laptops. Bare minimum. So you all have, all teachers have a laptop that you can use, or if there's an extra uh, if there's an extra Chromebook or a Chrome box, they all have a camera that goes with them. So bare minimum is your teacher laptop. Your desktop has a camera as well. Um, your laptop might, uh, your desktop all in one computer in the room. Some has a simple slide that slides over or someone has a little camera that you push down and pops up out of the screen. So all, all in one computers has a built-in camera so that's too, if you're at a school that has a dedicated all-in-one computer to the smart board or interactive flat panel, and then your teacher laptop. Of course, you can, a teacher can go out and purchase a webcam and of course, and that can be done through Amazon, Walmart, or any of the stores. And they're pretty range from prices between uh, $30 to $3,000, of course, but that's- but Sheldon, uh, just to reiterate, we are not, asking teachers to go out and buy devices. We're just giving them 
ideas of if they would like to, they are welcome to, but that is not what we are asking. The devices that they have in their classroom are able to be used and we're just giving ideas. All suggestions, all of it is suggestions. Um, because, but, that, but definitely you have your teacher laptop, which has a webcam and or the all-in-one that's in the room with a webcam as well. If your all-in-one does not have a webcam, call help desk, they will make a replacement for you. Okay. Um, so then, Yelena, back to what you were presenting on. There were some questions about how to use breakout rooms um, when you also have students in the classroom. Yeah, so one of the um, suggestions that I gave is to actually use breakout rooms as individual rooms. So you could have, if I'm not mistaken, and Kathleen is more of an expert in this, but you could have, I think, up to like 50 breakout rooms. Um, and obviously, you're going to have less students than that. So one of the ways that you could is have um, a breakout room for each student. And that way you don't need to worry about the management of the students. They go to their individual breakout rooms and then they work on either their individual activities. So maybe a digital activity like going on Zern, for instance, or depending obviously on the grade level and the content area, or students can still collaboratively work, right? Like with the digital tools, like having a collaborative slide deck or having a tool like Jamboard or a tool like Padlet. So, and again, if you have um, specific questions or some ideas, or you want us to come and do a professional development on doing collaboration in digital environment, we can absolutely do that. But that's just, again, one example that I can think of in terms of breakouts. If you only have one teacher in the room um, and you're not able to necessarily manage the at home students because you are in that particular moment working with your in class students. Right. And Yelena, one of the things that I've heard um, throughout a lot of the Zoom sessions that I've been running is that teachers are really enjoying using that breakout for those small groups. And with Zoom, you can actually, I believe it's up to a hundred breakouts depending on the number of participants. But you as the teacher can then move from breakout to break out, to join that student, to have your um, small conferencing and um, answer those questions. And that way you still have that connection with students that you may not have in the waiting room. Okay, so we will bounce back to Sheldon. Um, and Sheldon, people are wondering about getting into their classrooms before going back, if there will be people to help them um, get things set up um, and practice beforehand? Um, so I don't know the answer to that. It all depends on your principal and who, how many people is allowed to be in your building at a time. And if your principal, if that's something you want, I think you need to work with your principal to arrange for uh, someone from TO Instruction Tech, for example, myself, or a help desk support person to be in the building. But probably what work best is to first go to your room, see what you need, create a ticket with help desk. And then that way they can then fix all those issues and then let you know when it's done. And then you can go back and check again. So you may need to make multiple trips, but still work with your principals. Only come to your building if your principal says it's okay to do so. Okay, and along, kind of along with that um, staying uh, with you, Sheldon, was about um, getting support from IT um, for that. So I think I didn't ask that question right, but it's getting support to do that as well. Yeah, so um, for example, I'm working with uh, School 54 uh, soon to help them get ready. It, it, the time is coming down to the crunch. It's really hard to try to get everyone now, especially when school's starting in March, uh, sorry, February 4th, I believe, um, to get to everyone. Uh, there's only a few of us. So the best way to do is to work with your principal to arrange something for someone to help you if you need the assistance. Or contact your building. There are people who are great in using technology, some superstars in your building that you can use to help you get yourself ready. So take advantage of the support and the superstars in your schools with your principal. Okay. Uh, so another question was about smart boards. And I think this one's really for both you and Jelena. 
um, is about how to use a smart board um, with this method of teaching, but then also how to clean it and make sure it's okay to use in this situation if, if the teacher chooses to use it. So to sanitize the smart board, we talked about the yellow Lysol wipe, which will be great. You just wipe it down if you need to. Um, if you're the only one using the smart board, you shouldn't, you don't have to clean it as regularly since you're the only person using it. You may want to before you start the day, just give it a quick wipe down, the pens and erasers, just to make sure that nothing happened to them or someone been using them when you're not there. But if you're gonna have multiple students, by them sanitizing their hand first, then using a the smart board, it will keep both you and them safe. So either sanitize your hand first and then use a smart board or use the, uh, the yellow Lysol wipes and give it a wipe down at the end of the night or whenever you feel is necessary to do so. Okay, and then Yelena, are there ideas for how to use that with the um, synchronous teaching um, simultaneously with students at home and then also the students remote? Um, so definitely using the smart board um, for a teacher uh, and as, a, as the teacher is writing on the smart board, they can share um, that right through Zoom for students to see at home and the students in class could see it. Um, if the question is about students coming up to the boards, uh, again, you'd have to follow the CDC guidelines. Um, you'd have to be sanitizing uh, the pens every single time. And then there's a student coming up and touching the board that needs to be sanitized every time as well. So again, it's gonna really depend on what you think would be best. Um, if you are able to have students interact with the content at, in their seats, obviously that would be better for safety of everyone. So again, if they have paper and pencil or sticky notes or um, some kind of individual whiteboards or sleeves, um, that might be a little bit better per se, but I think it's going to really depend on your situation and um, how, you know, how many students you might have in the class, things like that. Okay. Um, and I believe that um, Kathleen, I'm going to ask you a quick question because I know you were talking with them about this. Um, it, it was talked about, but it, it still is asked quite a few times about getting the supplies, the sanitizer and the cleaning products. Yep. So I know I've been working with Stacy Darby quite a bit in the past couple of weeks preparing for this. And I know um, a lot of people are asking, why aren't they there in the building now? Um, the district did receive a donation of Lysol wipes that they are starting to distribute to the schools that will be used for um, cleaning the technology only. So not to clean your classroom. That's gonna be where you use that blue spray. And um, we're gonna let the Department of Health and Safety go through all of the cleaning things with you and, and all of that. We just wanted to look at the technology piece um, and talking with Stacy, you know, you wipe down the you wipe down the shared devices once, twice a day with a Lysol wipe. Um, it's only got a two minute um, time, so you wipe it down, let it sit wet for a little bit, then wipe it down um, to get all of the germs off. But our main focus is going to be hand hygiene. So as long as the students come up use sanitizer before they use the shared equipment, um, then they're, they're set. I know that the um, rate of transmission on surfaces is, it has been shown to be very, very low. So, but I'm gonna let Stacy go into all that as she works with you guys um, with, with health and safety and the cleaning supplies. So Lysol wipes will be supplied to the schools to be used only for the technology. The other cleaners, you will have the hand sanitizers are already at schools and also the blue spray with, um, and with all the directions and all of that. And we are writing all of this up and we'll get it out to all of the schools so that you have it in writing as well. Okay, um, Sheldon, are you there? Yes, ma'am. Okay, um, obviously, as we can all see from the chat, our number one question um, seems to be about Chromebooks in the classroom. 
Mm -hmm. um, and we were wondering if you could talk about that a little bit. Well, I just got some late breaking news, just broken just now, well, actually now. So I've been working on this. If you are a 912 school and you have students that are taking their Chromebooks home every day, they can continue to do so once school starts again. So for kids who are nine through 12, um, that are one-to-one -one Chromebook, they will use their backpacks, of course, to bring their Chromebook back and forth to schools. They can continue to use those. If there are Chromebooks in the classroom, Chrome boxes, sorry, Chrome boxes in the classroom, they can use those as well. So some grade levels have Chrome boxes in the classroom. They can continue to use those. Um, uh, I'm not certain about the lower grades yet. I'm getting some more information. But as of right now, for grades nine through 12, if you are, have been used, if your school is used to carrying, Chrome, delivering your Chromebooks back and forth home every day, you can do so once we start again face-to-face. Okay. One more bit of information, not related to Chromebooks, but related to teachers assistants, TAs who need to have a laptop, work with your principals to, or contact your principal and ask them to contact help desk to get a laptop for your TAs as well. The Instructional Technology Department is working and they're trying to get um, laptops to principals who contact help uh, the Instructional Tech Department. So contact help desk. Okay, great. So that is really all that we have for the questions at this point. I know that there have been some more that we can't get to. Uh, I did try my best to read um, all of that. Um, if you need to reach out, we do have the IT department does have office hours that are on our CSD Learns and you can reach us there. And there were a few questions about um, if they're gonna be offered ways of how to do this going forward. So next week on the 20th, is when um, there will be individual meetings with the directors that you can go to. And then the following week, they'll be uh, doing individual meetings as well. And the IT department, we will be doing some to review some of this with more of a tech focus. Um, so all of that is available. And the slides for this presentation um, are available. That was another common question. Those are available on the um, simultaneous instruction um, document that was sent out. And in just a moment here, I'm going to get the link for the survey at the end of this, and I will put that on there as well. Um, oh, did someone else say something? Oh, yep. And um, Allison, once um, this is done, the link that everybody joined to get to the YouTube, that will redirect you to our RCSD Learns website where we will have the video of both this PD and the ones um, that are coming up on the 20th and 27th. And we'll have all those on one page along with this, um, with this presentation for everyone to access. So that'll be on our RCSD Learns page. Including the survey. Yes. I just posted the survey on the simultaneous doc for people to get to. It's here on the screen that you can see the address if you'd like. Um, thank you for coming.